that date. I said, listen, I asked you for daily phone calls, and you're flunking. I said, so I think you better find another sponsor. In addition to me, I said, I'm, I'll always be your friend. I said, but you better call me daily when I ask you to call me daily because I'm the rat the bastard. I said, it doesn't work out that well, mm -hmm. you know, when you don't call. That's... I said, you know, 90 minutes... Well, see, Penny, minutes, Penny, I Penny, Penny, I have three sponsees that all they do is go to meetings and, uh, you know, that's it. And when they have big problems, call and complain. And I offer them books to write in, everything. Will not do it. And, you know, it's... It, you, you have to get miserable enough to follow directions, I guess. The gift. I say a lot of people don't get the gift of desperation. Yeah. That's the gift it. Of desperation is the greatest gift. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. Rolling. You're rolling? Oh, yeah, I've been rolling. Oh, you've been rolling as we talk about the program? Yeah, sure. Well, I want to tell you, it, it's the greatest gift of my life. And I, I sincerely <clears throat> mean every word that I say to those people wonderful fellows in my fellowship that I love so much. And of course now I'm all excited about Joe, who's got two days, and uh, David in the back who had seven, who had never even been there before. I mean, how, how great is that? So um, that's, that's really the sustenance of my life. You know, when Dee Dee or Michelle would say to me, don't you want to spend the night and see the children? You know, on Christmas morning, I would say, no, I've got to have Christmas morning with the people that make you want to have me come and have Christmas with you, because that's really the truth, you know? So anyway, that's all I can say about the gift of AA. It's certainly not for those who don't understand it. I mean, you can't explain it. You have to be desperate to go into AA. I mean, desperate. So. No. You mean you don't wake up in the morning and say, when you're a little kid, I want to be an alcoholic one day when I grow up? No. <laughs> it's the last thing I think any alcoholic, everyone's ambition is to get into AA. I don't know a single soul in or out of the program that, that wishes to get into Alcoholics Anonymous. No. Not anybody. You just have to be desperate enough to want to stop drinking. And even sometimes just to know you have to stop you don't want to stop. And so that's, that, that's the gift of desperation, which actually means G-O-D. And anyway, have you got a question for me, Suzanne? No, I've got tons of questions. And we're, we're, we're moving off, off program, program. Yeah, let's get off program. Um, I wanted to talk to you actually about remembering uh, mom and dad when dad was painting. Do you remember when he started painting? I do exactly know exactly. Um, he started in 1942 with Cobweb Castle. Cobweb Castle was the first thing he painted. I was 15 years old, and just he just had to sit on the porch. He was 43. He had to sit on the porch and look directly. Cobweb Castle was directly in front of our house. And he was fascinated by that architecture and fascinated with the scene of the water behind it. I mean, we had a real view of the ocean in those days. I mean, you look out on these fancy, dancy houses. Not really fancy, very expensive wall-to-wall -wall houses. But in the, when we moved in there, I was 15, and that's when Daddy sat down on the front porch and painted Cobweb Castle. And then what happened to him that winter, um, he started painting boats, you know, copying them from books so that he could get mother into doing it together. And they had turned, they had turned their master bedroom, which had a fireplace, into a den because I had started dating Bob Wilkinson. And so they knew that uh, they wanted their privacy, and they didn't want me down in the basement with Robert Wilkinson because they had seen Jimmy Lewis and I go down there together <laughs> and come back up with a little smeared lipstick and all of that. So they turned their master bedroom and went into what I called the nursery. 
So on the second floor of the house you never lived in, the house that I wept over to leave at 18, uh, there were four bedrooms, and the master bedroom had the fireplace, and it had a, it faced like this room with a, a window here and a lovely window seat up here. And I remember as a child sitting there looking at mother nursing the babies. In that beautiful sunlight, she'd be sitting there. She was a true Madonna with this baby, uh, babies that she was nursing. And I'm sitting there. It was a time when she was sitting still and I could talk to her. I remember that as a, a very good time because even when, uh, you know, when uh, Di was born, which uh, that was a very bad time because that was the year that, uh, that was the year that Josie was burnt. And, uh, but before that, like when I was five and uh, she was nursing Leonid or uh, Josie, you know, I'd be sitting there. That was my time with my mother when she was nursing the baby. So it's no wonder I prayed for these babies. You know, every night I'd get my father who always said prayers with me. You know, I know it's more normal for the mother to pray with the child, but I guess mother was worn out at the end of the day and it was daddy's job. And uh, he sat there, knelt by the bed with me and I did everything to keep him going. I, I uh, prayed for not only the milkman, the postman, every aunt and uncle, uh, you know, cousins, brothers, sisters, and, and then I, I would get to the end and I would always say, and please God, give us another baby. And I mean, we had a house full of babies. I was like six years old and there were four younger than me. And daddy would say, don't you think we have enough babies, Marion? This is kind of the way my prayers would end. And I'd say, well, no, because they make mommy so happy. But as I'm telling you the story right now, I am knowing why I love mother with babies, because I got to be there on the window seat and I got her full attention. Because certainly the baby wasn't getting anything but milk. I was getting mother's eyes looking at me as I talked to her. And uh, it's funny that never came up until right now, that, that memory, that memory of sitting there on the window seat with my mother. And I have many wonderful memories of mother and Taunty as a child. Taunty was my mother's you know, aunt. Her taunty, we called her that because she loved French. And apparently she was the exact opposite of my mother. And I guess maybe... Um, your I, mother or your grandmother? Or our grandmother? Well, my grandmother. My mother's mother. Yeah, that's right. And mother had a difficult relationship with her. And she had a very strong personality, apparently. Yeah. And she liked to uh, go into the city. And I, all my life, I thought, you know, Grandma was a party girl because the way Mother talked about her, that's the way it sounded. Like she loved hats and feathers and velvets and, you know, and all of that. She loved clothes and she'd take off in the morning. And I, she left unmade beds and dirty dishes and help probably was hard to get for her. And... So mother would have to come home after school, and she, she would do that, I guess, and she resented it. So that's why she never let me do any housework. Never let me do a strip of housework, except Wednesday nights when they had their night and Mary went out, Mary fixed a dinner, it was heated up by mother, and afterwards Peggy and I did the dishes. I just remember it as a song fest. I don't know what Peggy remembers, but all of I remember about doing the dishes was how much fun it was to sing with Peggy. I and love I, doing the dishes. I, I love doing the dishes and washing them, and I love it up in New, New Hampshire when we have a sink about this big. And uh, <clears throat> it's a happy, happy memory of childhood with, with Aunt Peggy. 
you, you know, because I was always trying to be with her, and she was always trying to get away from me. I mean, she thought I was the biggest pest in the world, and she used to run up to Mary Montgomery and say, take her away from me, get her away from me, and Mary would say, well, just kick her. You know, like that. She said, Marion, why don't you leave Peggy alone? I'd say, but I want to play with her. I want her to like me. Now, we slept in the same room and everything, uh, but uh, she didn't want to play with me. And uh, hardly anybody wanted to play with me. I must have been pretty obnoxious. The only thing <laughs> that I remember about the neighborhood was that I went to dancing class, and they had a recital every year, and I had all these costumes, and naturally I outgrew them. So I would put on these big productions with Harry Rigby, who did become a producer. You've heard about Harry Rigby, right? Well, you can tell me more about that. Well, Rigby. Harry Rigby lived down the street, and he was a big sissy. Everybody called him sissy, sissy, sissy. His father even hired a football, uh, uh, a football player from Penn for the whole summer to try and make him a man. Can you imagine that? But Harry liked to sing and dance. So when Harry heard about my productions, even though we lived way right down on Hillside Road, he came up and said, can I help you? I'm like about nine or 10 or 11, something like that. So Harry and I would produce these backyard things. And there was two huge trees. I'd love to go see if they're still there. And I would make everybody hide behind these tree trunks until the music for them was to come on and dance. And I made everybody in the neighborhood pay a quarter, the parent. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but a quarter back in the 30s probably was worth like $5 today, right? Something like that. But anyway, the neighbors had to come because their children were in it. And they were wearing my costumes. And my mother used to tell the story about how horrible it was that I'd put on these productions, usually when she was getting rooms painted and there was painters in the house. And all these kids were running through the house, putting on their costumes and, and all of that. But So I, I was into theater. Never you mind, I was into theater. I was a producer. I produced those things where they leapt out from two. You were never lovely. <laughs> I just, when I think of it, I just, I have to laugh. I have to laugh. What torture my poor mother put up with. But anyway, I think later in life, she did uh, have a few laughs over that, right? Did she tell you any? Oh, she had a lot of laughs. Huh? I, I particularly love it when you tell the story about how you used to be the queen of Bell. Oh, wait, wait let, me, let me stop just for a second. 